Northern Life had the pleasure to sit down with renowned playwright, composer, and pianist Thompson Highway and local musician Patricia Cano. How old were you when you began to play piano? Oh, I was way too old to, be, to, uh, to, uh, to really consider a career as a professional concert pianist, 11. Because you see, there's no pianos up where I come from. Right. I was born in a tent, pitched in some bank, and we traveled across the North by Dallas, so it was very hard for those sled dogs to carry a grand piano around, <laughs> <laughs> around the door. So, uh, <clears throat> so I didn't really see my, the nearest piano to us was like 300, 500 kilometers south of us in the Palm Manitoba. So that was the first time I saw a piano was when I went to a boarding school. <clears throat> and I picked it up there and I taught myself to begin with until I was caught sneaking into the piano room one day by a nun. Because I went to a school that I was run by nuns and uh, she caught me playing with the instrument. And I didn't start writing until, until I was 30 years old. I, didn't, I think I was capable of writing until I was 30. I just thought writing was for other people. Artists, artistry was for other people. So I, I tried it and lo and behold it worked. I was quite, I was quite surprised. Did you have, did, did it all come from within or did you have external influences? Or oh, of course I had external influences. I was influenced by everybody that I met along the way. My father was an accordionist. My grandfather was a fiddler, uh, <coughs> a legendary fiddler. Uh, I met many artists along the way. People encouraged me every step of the way to, to pursue my writing because apparently they liked my writing and thought I wrote, I wrote well. <coughs> and uh, then uh, when I started uh, teaching the piano my, by my, to myself, I, uh, people started noticing that I had, I had a musical capability. So the teachers picked me up. And eventually the teacher who picked me up, the, who was, had this William A. turned to change my life, he had the same teacher as uh, Glenn Gould. Really? You know? So I have that kind of pianistic pedigree, like really, really fine, like the best of the country. And, and would that have been when you were at, at that university in, yep. in London? Yeah. First the University of Manitoba right. and then the University of Western Ontario. So that, that, that was the thing, like, because William A. taught me not just about music, he taught me about visual art, philosophy, poetry, literature, all that stuff. That really what, what, what fired my imagination. And about uh, philosophy and native mythology, this mm. is where Patricia met you because she took a course of yours at the <coughs> University of Toronto yep. where you were comparing, was it the, the Cree Cree mythology, Cree mythology, the Christian mythology and, Aber and Greek mythology. Yeah. So did teaching you, at the University of Toronto. So did you, were you talking about the Medeoan Lodge? The well, not so much about the Medeoan Lodge, but the, myth of the mythological figures, figures from inside Cree and other Aboriginal mythologies. So I was teaching there and she was a student in my class and she was 18 years old, she was a sweet young thing and uh, pretty as a peach, which of course she still is. And, uh, and all of a sudden there she was in that class and I was quite shocked. And you know why I was shocked? Because I would met her when she was six years old. Six years old? Yeah. Here in That's right because... Uh, my yeah. partner uh, is from Sudbury right. and uh, an old family from Sudbury going back generations and uh, they uh, lived, the, my, my partner's sister lived just down one street. block down the street from uh, Patri Pat Patricia Cannon's family. And uh, my sister and I had three daughters who were about the same age as her, so she was always at the house playing with those girls. So she grew up with those girls. And so I met her at school. Of course, we used to go to the Christmas gatherings to my sister and sister in law's house. And there she was, as a little girl of six, in this incredible dress. I always remember that dress. It was, it was beautiful. White, dress. white, great big, huge dress. She looked, like a, she looked like a giant snowflake. It's not true. Susie Snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> You've given talks all over the world, mm -hmm. and I, I, and are there are some things in the First Nations worldview mm -hmm. that we in in, uh, in the West and in China and in India can learn from, in terms of respect for nature, mm -hmm. respect for the el elders, yeah, absolutely. respect for the next seven generations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> at one point in time, when 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 the Christianity first arrived here in North America in 1492. Um, the, the Pope of Rome believed that native people did not have a soul. It, there had to be a, some kind of conference among the bishops of Rome to, to decree us into human beings, essentially. Because prior to that, we didn't have souls. We weren't considered to have souls. So at one point in time, about 50 years after the African Columbus' arrival in North America, we were finally given the right to have souls. So now we have souls, thank goodness. Thank, thank goodness to the Pope and his generosity. <laughs> but one of the things that I find really, 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 really wrong about uh, Christian mythology, let's, let's just leave it at that, as opposed to theology, that's because that's too, too powerful and disturbing a subject for too many people, is that it still to this very day considers nature as having no soul. Nature has no soul. A tree is a dead, living, inanimate thing, an object. 
Well, that is not the case in native mythology. In native mythology, native theology, it's the precise opposite. Nature has a soul. A tree is a living, breathing, animate being. A so is a rock. So is the soil. So is, uh, you know, all that. All these creatures have equal status to us. There is no hierarchy or power. All that. That's. I would just. I would just like to uh, <coughs> assist in any way that I can, spreading the news that nature does have a soul, contrary to what the Pope tells us. And would this come out in your plays? Mm -hmm. And your prose, yes, it does. And your books, I hope so. And what I about my very best. and what about this upcoming uh, cabaret? Mm. Um, well, this upcoming cabaret where we're coming and doing it's part and process of my life's work, I suppose, because uh, I write, I like to write, and uh, uh, <clears throat> there will be a storyline that will connect the, play, the, the twelve songs together eventually, within the next few months. But at the moment, there is only a, a, just a very, very thin line. Uh, which I can actually I don't really feel free to talk about right now, but it will talk about. Uh, well, this particular one is more of a comedy than anything else. But, but that's play. another aspect of of First Nations. Yeah, to make people you, laugh. They, you have, you are humorous people. Well, you yeah, laugh. We have, yeah, we love to laugh. That's yeah. right. We're not very good at many things. <laughs> yeah. We're not like we're not great at creating, uh, inventing computers, and, and inventing jumbo jets and all that kind of stuff. But we are good at laughing. We do laugh very, very hard. We're good laughers, and so that's one of the things I like to spread: is make people. I like to make people laugh. I like this. My favorite, my third favorite sound I figured one day is the sound of human laughter. After the sound of the way, the wind through the trees, and the sound of the water lapping up against the shore, I like human human laughter. My favorite sound, and I like it so much that I do anything within my power to hear it as often as possible. So when people come to the cabaret next Friday, yeah. Be, they have to, they have to expect that <clears throat> they will be laughing. If they don't laugh, they will be thrown out of the theater. <laughs> 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 we have bodyguards at the front. But they also <laughs> they also will hear uh, Patricia. They hear a fantastic fantastic singer. vocalist. She is so good that when you hear her cry, if you close your eyes and you and you and you listen to her voice, you just you start to cry. Your your, chest, your entire chest hair you starts heaving. There will be songs of love, lullabies. Um, tongue twisters, theatrical, very theatrical pieces, and uh, but most of all, I, hopefully you'll just have a really good time. And beautiful music. Oh yeah, beautiful music. Sung <laughs> of by course. Sung by I was talking about the music. Singer. And yeah. a sax player, our sax player, was more than he's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, he's fantastic. The cabaret will be held at the TNO on August 7th at 8 p.m. Please phone 705-929-1736 to reserve tickets.